Give me an S. Give me an I. Give me a C. What does that spell? Silicon carbide. Go wide band gap materials. <laughs> I bet you never heard that cheer in high school, huh? <laughs> well, now you have and you're welcome. <laughs> Why are we rooting for wide band gap materials? Because they're going to save the world. Duh. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but wide band gap is changing how the power game is played. From our electric vehicles and their charging stations, our solar power, our servers, our industrial power supplies, and more. And it's only going to get even better from here. Yeah, you might want to invest in that silicon carbide jersey. Just saying. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk and head Silicon Carbide cheerleader. Joining me to lead the charge is Brandon Becker from On Semiconductor. Brandon and I investigate the advantages of silicon carbide diodes and MOSFETs and why size reduction, efficiency, and bomb cost reduction make silicon carbide the team to beat. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about on semiconductors, silicon carbide, diodes, and MOSFETs. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia, for having me. Okay, so we are here to talk about wideband gap and silicon carbide. But before we get in too deep, can you set the scene for me? Now, I'm not sure I know about on semiconductor in this space. So how did you get here? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. I think the best way to kind of cover that is take a look at the market in general and where ON is and, and kind of where we came from. So if you look here, ON is currently ranked number six in the latest YOL power report for silicon carbide. And we came here from very, very small. I think we were number 11. And the way that we've been able to do this is to really leverage our technology, leverage our customer engagements, and continue to start designing in. So I'm really, really excited about where we are going. Excellent. Okay, so Brandon, what do you think are the biggest markets for silicon carbide? There's definitely four major markets when it comes to this. So first is automotive, where approximately 2 million electrical vehicle cars were sold last year in 2018. Of course, you need to be able to charge those cars, and there was 13 million chargers that are projected to be installed in 2020. And then we kind of move into the renewable energy and solar market, where there's 307 gigawatts of solar panels installed today. And last but not least is the power supply market, where all the cloud computing, AI, where we take all this data and we have to be able to process it. But of course, there's many markets that this plays in, including you know, medical, motor control, industrial equipment, auxiliary power, railways, wind power, appliances. So every application, every market can really be a user of this stuff. Cool. Okay. So let's dive into that first one, automotive. Now, why do you see silicon carbide playing a big role here? Yeah, automotive is going to be the biggest market for silicon carbide. And the reason why is because we're moving away from the gas cars. We've already moved into hybrid cars and full electric cars. So some of the main things is that the silicon carbide enables a cost savings, you know, approximately $750 that you get on battery range alone. Also governments, California, Europe, even in Asia and China are all signing government orders to boost the production of electric vehicles. Okay, so let's talk about that second market. That was EV charging stations, I believe, right? Yeah, so EV charging stations or electrical vehicle charging stations are going to be really important once the electrical vehicles are on the road. You know, if you think about it today, if you drive anywhere, every corner or every other corner, there's gas stations in every city. And when we have a majority of electrical cars on the road, we're going to have to charge them. Now, a couple of things to think about is most of the chargers on the market today are a level one and a level two charger. So I'll talk about moving to a level three and a level four. Also, I think that we demand the time it takes to charge a car is about the same as refilling a gas tank, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a big reason why we're going to be moving to these silicon carbide products. I did want to touch on the differences between the charging station levels. If you look at a level one and level two, as I mentioned, those are what's really available today. And those are AC charging. 
So what that means is you stick the end into the car and then the car has to do a AC to DC converter. So that's what's an onboard charger and then they charges the battery. So it's a very slow process because you have to use the car to charge the battery. But if we could create an AC to DC voltage change off the car and then when we plug in our cars it goes directly into the battery, now we can slow that time down to under 10 minutes. That would be really cool. All right, Brandon. So let's talk about that third market you mentioned, renewable energy. And I'm really curious about this one in particular. The renewable energy market is just gigantic. And I think that this, along with some of the cloud stuff, is where silicon carbide is the most mature. It's been in production for many years now. You can see that the trends of people's houses and residential, adding solar panels, commercial buildings, covering the parking spaces with solar panels has really increased. And so there's a big trend to continue to install more and more solar panels. Additionally, only about 1% of the world's electricity is generated from solar. And we predict this to reach about 15% over the next 10 to 15 years. So that's a huge, a ginormous amount of new development, new silicon carbide, more efficiencies, more products that has to go into the renewable energy market. Lastly, a lot of the governments, again, are getting involved in this because we want a greener world. We want to leave a less carbon footprint. So we need to increase the amount of energy we're taking from renewable resources. Sure. Okay. Now, Brandon, I have heard that silicon carbide is important in the server market, but this also transcends to the industrial power market as well, right? That's absolutely correct. The server market's very important because, you know, there's big server farms that are being made and these are hosting. Now that we have all these online content forums like social media, AI, video streaming, we need to be able to process out all that power. So it's still very important that the server and industrial power market are using silicon carbide to get better efficiencies. But Likewise, these power supplies are still being used in UPS systems, in motor controls, in anything that does power conversion. A very popular topology that we're able to use from the silicon carbide is a PFC boost converter. And some of the advantages are higher efficiencies, increased power densities, bidirectional power flow, and of course, reduced component count. So it really does make a big difference. Okay, so let's talk about silicon carbide specifically versus silicon MOSFET. Now, what does silicon carbide buy me as an engineer here? Yeah, it buys you a lot. And I think the best way to do this is to see it visually. So I show you a little diagram of a silicon carbide 60 million MOSFET versus a super junction, which is a silicon MOSFET. And you can just visually see the die size difference. So what does that do? Well, it gives you better power density. So you have higher efficiencies, you have higher power density, you can actually run your systems at a higher operational frequency, and just the material themselves allow for higher temperature. So then I drop down and show you the different material properties of the silicon versus silicon carbide, and that's where we kind of get this wide band gap name from, is because you can see the first parameter there, silicon has a 1.1 electron volt versus a 3.3 for SIC. And then across the board, you can see two to three times X all the parameters, including electric field, saturation velocity, mobility, and thermals. All together, this gives you big application benefits, including higher voltage, lower RDS on, lower switching, which then has an effect on the system, smaller passives, less cooling. So to wrap it all up, we get a smaller size system, lighter weight, higher efficiency, and better costs. Excellent. Okay, so can we take a closer look at what a silicon carbide diode would look like? Yeah, definitely. So the picture on the left is a simple silicon carbide diode, and it has a substrate drift region, and then it has your contacts. But there's really three main parameters that we design around, and it's kind of trade-offs, but the key from us, from a device manufacturing, is to optimize all these three parameters, which is VF, which is the device turn-on, ruggedness, which is your leakage, how much does your device leak and as well as reliability. We do not want any failures in any system. And these then in turn give you your application benefits, which is very small reverse recovery, higher blocking, low leakage, and surge and avalanche capabilities. 
Okay, so let's attack that first design feature, VF. Yeah, so VF is your forward voltage. And, and what that really does is that says, okay, when your device turns on, how quickly does it turn on? The quicker it turns on, the less leakage you have, and, and in turn, the less energy you're using. So on semiconductor uses a shocky barrier uh, SICK diode that has lower VF than what we can measure with our competitors. This results in lower losses and greater power density. Cool. Okay. So what about that next one? Uh, ruggedness, I believe. What's the story there? We use the term ruggedness because it's like you can throw this against the wall and it will not break. And when we're in an application, we want our stuff to be very rugged. So the key is with the rugged is the leakage. When things start to leak, then they start to break down. And we want that to be very strong. So the first diagram here shows your leakage. And you can see that for a 650 volt diode, our design, which is the circles, has a very tight spread, which means that our design is very good. It hits at 650 volts and then it turns off. While some of our competitors have to have a very big design window because over temperature, they shift a whole bunch. The diagram on the right shows our leakage over temperature. So you can see as we heat up, we don't leak, whereas some of the competitor parts we have leaks magnitudes greater than ours. So overall, on semis shocky barrier diodes always maintain the best in class behavior in regards to leakage. Cool. Okay. So then let's talk about that last one, reliability. Well, reliability is arguably the most important. And I think a big thing is that the JEDEC committee is still going through creating the specs for silicon carbide as well as gallium nitride because they're new. And so one thing that we did is we took our H3TRB test, which is high temperature, high humidity, and high bias, and we ran them all at 85%. So we have an 85 degrees C, 85% relative humidity, and we did our voltage at 85%. Now, JEDEC, for example, is spec to hold that at a constant 100 volts for silicon, but for silicon carbide, we wanted to stress it even higher. And what we found is that when we stressed it at a much higher voltage, we did not fail while other people failed. And in turn, this comes from a patented termination structure, which provides superior robustness for harsh environment conditions. Cool. Okay. So Brandon, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about silicon carbide MOSFETs. Now, what are we really looking at when we talk about silicon carbide MOSFETs? Yeah. Silicon carbide MOSFETs are interesting because they're growing like crazy. They're growing like wildfire. And really, when you look at a silicon carbide MOSFET, there's two different things to look at, and that's the structure. There's a lateral structure, which is uh, the most common in the market. And then there's a trench structure, which follows the power silicon uh, MOSFET structure. The biggest thing to be aware of in the trench MOSFET is that you get an extremely large electric field on the gate. The gate oxide on silicon carbide MOSFETs is the key parameter when you create these. And when you have a very large electric field on that gate, that makes the diode susceptible to breaking. Ah, okay. Similar to the silicon carbide diodes, the silicon carbide MOSFETs have another three key design parameters. Okay. When you want to look at a, a silicon carbide MOSFET, you want to say, okay, let's look at the RDS on, the resistance. You want to know how does this part switch, the speed, the stability, how much loss does it have, as well as the body diode. You want to make sure that you have low QRR, low TRR, no change in the switching, as well as a very rugged body diode. You don't want that to, to start to break down and cause leakage in your system. Right. Okay. So let's talk about that first thing on your list, device resistance. Yeah. So one of the neat things about silicon carbide is that when you take a part that has a resistance, let's say, for example, 80 milliohms, then when you run that from minus 50 C to up to 175 to Z, we only get a 1.6 X shift in RDS on over temperature, where compared to silicon, it can shift up to two and a half times as much. Wow. So over temperature, you get a much better, much tighter control of your device. Additionally, the graph on the right shows how biasing your gate voltage changes the RDS on resistance. So depending on which voltage you use on your MOSFET can have an impact on how much resistance you get out of your device. Okay. So let's talk about switching. That was next on your list, right? Yeah. Switching is also very important. 
I like to start off with this little diagram on the left here, and it kind of just shows the differences between your silicon carbide, your silicon, and your IGBTs. So if you take a silicon carbide MOSFET and compare everything to it, a silicon MOSFET has an RDS-on area that's 100 times bigger, and switching losses are three to five times bigger. Now, if we look at an IGBT, you have an RDS-on or a die size area three to five times bigger with a switching loss of 10 times bigger. So silicon MOSFETs are really approaching an ideal switch. They have a good combination of low RDS-on and low switching. So in turn, we can see some waveforms. The waveform on the top compares to our silicon MOSFET, our superjunction. There's some arrows that show the turn on and turn off of the silicon carbide, and you can see that it's much quicker than the superjunction or the silicon MOSFET. Yeah. On the bottom graph, it shows some switching waveforms compared to IGBTs. So you can see that there's no tail current, and you can see the speed and stability of the switching. And all that area in between the green and the red is losses in your system. So when you're switching this over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours and you're paying for all this power, you're losing all that power. So that's where you really get an advantage in the switching performance of silicon carbide MOSFETs. Cool. Okay. And body diode performance was last on the list, right? Yeah. The body diode has to be designed well because that will start to break down when you're in hard switching. So on semiconductor requires that silicon MOSFETs undergo repetitive operation for 168 hours. And this test really tests the body diode and the MOSFET at different DVDTs, so different voltage stresses, IDSs, different currents, and different frequencies. Cool. Okay. So Brandon, what does this really look like? What kind of results can I expect? Well, the good news is it's kind of boring because what it shows is that the pre-test and the post-test are identical. And what that means is that So we're showing the drain current over many, many lots, and the pre-test and the post-test don't show much variation, which is what we want. Okay, so now that we've tackled how they work and what markets they fit in, what does On Semiconductor really have in this space? Yeah, so I like to think that On Semiconductor is one of the biggest and broadest portfolios of silicon carbide on the market. And I think this kind of summarizes up in one page, if you can believe it or not. The top half shows our diodes. So we have diodes that are 650 volts, 1200 volts, and 1700 volts all released to the market today. We have them all in die form so that anybody can embed them into PCB or they can buy them for their own module making. But we have through-hole packaging, we have surface mount packaging, as well as a number of different modules. Now we'll take a look at the different MOSFETs that we have. We have 650 volt MOSFETs, 900 volt MOSFETs, 1200 volt MOSFETs, and 1700 MOSFETs in development. The packages that we have for the MOSFETs include the through-hole packages, again, the surface mount packages, and a number of modules for those as well. Cool. Okay. So I know packaging is really important in this space. How does On Semiconductor address the packaging needs here? Yeah, packaging is really important because packaging is a huge differentiator in these wide band gap devices, specifically silicon carbide, because we want really low inductance packaging. Now, we have the ability to take standard packages like a TO247, but the guts inside, we can do different materials, we can do different die attaches, we can do different things to lower the inductance and the resistance of those standard packaging. So something that ON has is we have a world-class ecosystem to develop packages. We can start with simulations. We can do mechanical, electrical, thermal, and fluid heat sink simulations. Then we can take all these new properties, solders, sinterings, different metals, and combine that. We have the equipment and the automation to drop schematics, to drop boards, to print it on PCBs. We have proof of concept lines. So if we have an idea, we can customize it manually, put it onto a line and produce it, and then we can test it. So we can run reliability tests on it. We can stress it. We can test it. That shortens our package development a lot. Another thing I found by talking to customers is customers want to have inputs on the package development. And when you use some other people versus us that all does it in-house, is you can see our simulations and work with us. You can see our materials and work with us. And that way, the customers have input into the design and we can work together to develop the best packaging solution on the market. 
With that, we have quite a few modules already. So we have uh, a couple different ones that have solder pins and that are press fit as well. And in these modules, we can do a bunch of different standard topologies, like for example, Vienna rectifier, bridgeless, a renaissance, diode, and MOSFET bridges. And this really gives us an advantage among other competitors that have to use external manufacturing or external module makers. Okay, so Brandon, this has been a lot to take in today, but what are the main points you'd like my audience to take away from our talk today? The main thing is wide band gap is really the best solution to every engineer's problem. Okay. (laughs) And it really is for three reasons, right? So first we have a size reduction. When you move to silicon carbide, you have the ability to redesign your boards, use less PCB, reduce your component count, reduce your parasitics, and make your solution smaller. When you make your solution smaller, you get efficiency improvements. Your losses, you, we can get up to 73% reduction in losses in different switching. So for example, a 5K boost converter, we can see up to 73% reduction in losses. And most importantly for anybody is a cost reduction. It's already been proven that at a bomb level that moving to silicon carbide can reduce your bomb cost. The good news is, is that I truly believe that the device cost of the silicon carbide is going to come down and come down and come down. And so if you're already producing solutions with silicon carbide, you're going to get benefits now and even bigger benefits later. Excellent. Well, Brandon, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun to talk about this and see silicon carbide really grow in the market. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about silicon carbide, MOSFETs, and diodes from On Semiconductor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.